Hey everybody and welcome to the first episode of Field Facts with Forrest. This is going to be our new YouTube series presented by Dive Bomb uh, and, and we're going to use this to do a few things but mainly to answer so many of those questions that we're getting asked all the time. Uh, we're fortunate enough to be able to travel around meet a ton of people but in doing so we get them uh, asking a lot of questions and uh, not only in person but Facebook uh, over our uh, Dive Bomb fan page uh, over the Instagram uh, and even through our personal social media outlets we get questions all the time so we're gonna use this not only to answer questions for some of you guys who've been hunting for 10 15 years and this is your passion but we're also gonna focus a lot uh, for the beginner for the guy who's starting from square one hasn't gone through hunter safety uh, so we're gonna get the full range of questions uh, that we're gonna try to answer for you here with this show now, before we get too far into it, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Again, my name's Forrest. Um, I got into hunting at a young age. I was about 10 or 11, about like most of you, and went out hunting with my dad. And from the first time I saw a mallard duck fly over and heard the wind on its wings, I was just done. This is, I knew this is what I loved. I became extremely passionate about it. And since then, I have devoted the majority of my free time and then some uh, towards becoming a better waterfowler. Um, now, when I was younger, I got into uh, blowing calls. That was the, the first thing I really wanted to do was learn how to blow a call. And I was, I was very blessed. I have met some great people, uh, namely uh, Mike Keller was one of the first to get me started. If you guys are familiar, some of you older guys might be familiar with Big Guy's Best Calls, uh, and he was the one who made those. So Mike taught me how to blow a duck call over the phone and got me ready for my first contest. And from there, it, it just started to roll for me. Um, got into goose calling as well. Well, I've been very fortunate in the calling world and, and I've got a couple calling contest titles that happen to have a world championship attached to it and I mean those mean the world to me but they don't mean everything so um, when I got into that and and the contest calling it opened up some more doors I got more and more invites to come hunting with people and then uh, hunting invites turned into invites to come and work as a guide so I've been have been very fortunate to hunt and guide not only in Colorado, but also for quite a bit of time in Texas. I spent a little bit of time in Arkansas. I've kind of bounced around. I've gotten to hunt a whole bunch of different neat places and meet a whole ton of really cool people in the process. Um, my wife and I live in Northern Colorado currently. Uh, we've been married for a few years now and we love spending time outdoors, not only hunting, but also fly fishing, hiking, etc. all the typical. Cool Colorado granola hippie stuff. Uh, we, we just love it here. Uh, but we also love going up to Alaska where I work in the summer. Uh, I fly float planes for a fishing lodge up there. And uh, I, I've been flying beavers in Alaska and getting to some pretty neat remote fishing places for a while. So really passionate about not only being outdoors, but kind of capturing outdoor moments as well. So uh, I got into photography. Gosh, I guess that's, that's getting on about 13, 14 years ago now. Uh, and I've been taking pictures of my hunts ever since. And I just absolutely love being able to not only experience these things, but get some pictures to share some of the experiences with people who haven't seen it yet, or, or even better, people who have and who you can sit there and relate to over some of this stuff. So that's a little bit about me, uh, just your, your average diehard waterfowler. And uh, I've been lucky to meet a bunch of really cool people who have shared some really neat information. And I'm going to try to share all that with you through this series. Okay. So as we get going um, on this first episode here, I'm not going to cover a whole lot, but I want to cover the top two questions that we get asked all the time. Okay. Now, the first of which is, can you mix silhouettes with full bodies? If I had a dollar for every time I heard this question, I would call Cody Stokes buy the decoy company from them and continue to sell these things because we get this question all the time. I mean, you name it. Heck, if, if you posted a picture of a limited geese over, in, uh, over a couple dive bomb bags, you've probably gotten asked if you can mix silhouettes with full bodies. So um, the resounding answer is yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, and the, the best thing I can tell you to do when it comes to silhouette decoys is treat them as if they were a full body. Okay, I can tell you firsthand from flying over the decoys, as you're in the air looking down on them, they don't look two-dimensional. Even when you're directly overhead, even on a cloudy day, they don't look two-dimensional. 
you can still see decoys all the time. And especially when the sun's out, you get these long shadows in the morning and the, in the evening. It's amazing uh, how well these decoys stand out, especially when they've got some flocking on them. Uh, flocked heads or the black and white uh, flocked silhouettes we've got out. The contrast is amazing. They'll show up better than a full body, uh, hands down. They, they really work well. Um, now, what I'm getting to with using these decoys as a full body is mainly the spacing. Okay, so when people get their first bag of silhouettes, uh, and I was this way too, I, I had zero faith in two-dimensional decoys, you know, 10 years ago when I started guiding with uh, my buddy Justin Hill down in Texas at Ranger Creek, and uh, he had to convince me to use them because I would, I would, I just live and die by the full body. But when I started hunting these silhouettes and he showed me how to spread them out and to, to use their distance to create the illusion of movement, just what it can do to geese. It's a different look. Not everybody uses them, and uh, even when mixed with full bodies, they add an element that you won't typically see in, in your average decoy spread of full bodies or shells. Uh, so, so they really are uh, a really nice tool to have. Um, ratio doesn't matter. If uh, let's let's say you're you're on the, uh, the the west coast and boys out west love their Dave Smith decoys and. I'm going to be honest with you, Dave Smith makes one of the best, if not the best looking full body decoy out there. They're really impressive, but you kind of have to take out a mortgage to be able to afford the things. Uh, he puts a lot of work into them, charges a, a good amount of, of money for them. Um, so if you want a big spread, but you can't afford to you know, put your truck up for collateral, um, you can supplement those spreads with these silhouettes. You know, get a couple dozen Dave Smiths or full bodies of, of whatever kind you like, and you can mix these decoys well because the colors are so accurate. They're actually photographs of geese that we've put onto these silhouettes. Um, they mix well with all the good looking full bodies, uh, and, and they, they really just add to those decoy spreads. So, um, whether you've already got a big spread, you know, 20, 30, 40 dozen full bodies, and you want to make it look bigger, it's a great thing to do with silhouettes, or you can just mix a few in here and there to, again, add the illusion of movement. Because these decoys gradually appear, and I won't say disappear, but their shape changes as you move around them, it really adds uh, a really cool aspect uh, that you wouldn't get with 3D decoys. Um, now, uh, another thing that we get asked uh, is, can I hunt them? Can, can I hunt over silhouettes where I am? Um, guys, again, West Coast, or, or you get in a pocket where guys are pretty sure they're hunting some of the toughest birds in the country, and they may very well be. Um, will birds respond well to a two-dimensional decoy? The answer, again, yes. Have faith in them. Run out and try them. If everybody in your area is using full bodies, you're probably going to have an advantage running silhouettes because it's something they haven't seen time and time and time again. When you're hunting these heavily pressured areas, silhouettes are a great way to differentiate yourself from all the other spreads out there. And I highly recommend adding at least a couple dozen to your spread just to kind of change up the look, whether it's just a couple of the standard V2Fs or whether, again, going with the black and whites for more contrast to make your spread pop from a greater distance. Uh, it, it's amazing the difference that, that adding silhouettes can make, uh, especially when no one in your area is using them. Um, another question we get is from guys who say birds are flaring at the edge of the decoys. Now, we don't hear this one nearly as often, but my advice, uh, a rule of thumb for me, is if birds flare, 95% of the time it's going to be your hide. Okay, so whether you're pie facing them and showing them your whole face as they're coming in, or whether your blinds aren't grassed up well enough, or, or whether you just don't have a, a good hide, it, it doesn't matter what it is, typically it's going to be your hide. If birds flare, it's your hide. If birds aren't working correctly or landing in wrong spots, uh, then you may start to change the shape of your spread. That's when I start to think about moving decoys or uh, say in the case of hunting big Canada geese, if they're not wanting to come right in and they, they kind of work to an edge, instead of um, you know being too concerned about my hide if they're not flaring, 
uh, rather, I'll open up a, an alley, uh, an area where the geese don't have to fly over decoys to where they can come in and be more comfortable uh, to come in and land in that landing zone that I've got set up for them. So keep that in mind. If birds flare, it's probably your hide. And if birds aren't working right, that's when you start to think about moving your decoys uh, or even your calling. There's a good chance you could be calling too much and scaring the birds out of the area. Okay. Now, the second question that we get asked all the time is what we like to run for a silhouette to sock ratio. And everybody's a little bit different. I wish there was a really nice black and white number that I could give you that would work all the time, um, but it varies. As far as purchasing decoys, I like to have about twice as many socks, or I, I take that back. I like to have twice as many silhouettes as I do socks, all right? Um, so, uh, let's say we're going out on a on an average day. We're going to say light winds. There's enough that the socks are are moving and full, um, but not enough that they're you know kind of ripping out of the ground. You know what, 40, 50 miles an hour wind. Okay. I like to go out and I like to mix my decoys evenly through things. I like to blend them through the spread, and you need enough socks to be able to filter them throughout the spread. Now. I don't know about you, but during my coronavirus quarantine, like we're all going through right now, um, I've listened to a lot of my wife's makeup tutorials, and all I hear is blend, 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 blend. Well, you're not done hearing it because you're going to hear it from me. The more you blend socks into silhouettes, the more natural it's going to look. If you only put socks where you're going to hide, it doesn't look right. And from the air, I can tell you, let's, let's say, for instance, a snow goose spread. Um, if you have a real dense area of socks right over where you're hiding, it looks like a line of toothpaste going through an otherwise realistic looking spread and it makes it very easy to pick out the hunters. So if you make sure you have enough socks to not only hide yourselves if you're hiding in the spread, but also make it look semi-uniform throughout the spread, you're going to have a lot more success. Um, another thing, uh, the wind, that's, that's a big thing. No wind is no good for socks. So if I have a completely calm wind day, I'm not going to run hardly any, if any, socks. And on those days where I have no wind, because I don't have socks to help hide me, I'm not going to hide in the decoys. So keep those things in mind. Um, you know, even though our decoys really do hold their shape very well, they still don't give that added movement that you're really looking for. It's not just the shape of the decoy that you're getting when you get the sock, it's also the added movement uh, and realism that you get, okay? Uh, another thing that comes into play when thinking about your sock to silhouette ratio is what species of bird are you hunting, okay? So if I'm hunting snow geese or lesser Canada's or ducks or something that moves a lot in the field, they're actively walking and searching out food all the time, I want a decoy with more motion and that's going to be the sock. So duck socks, oh my gosh, they are so effective. Same thing with snow geese. There's plenty of times where I'll run 130 dozen, 150 dozen strictly socks uh, and, and maybe I'll, I'll run some silhouettes around because I want to, but the socks just look so good as long as you've got some wind that they are really, really effective all by themselves. Now, conversely, if we're hunting Canada geese, say, say greater Canada geese, uh, something that's not going to be running through a field searching out food, but, but being a little bit more static, uh, you can have more success running a higher percentage of silhouettes. So uh, again, just all these different things to, to take into consideration when you're thinking about what spread to run on a specific day. But again, if you're just building a spread, I'd say have two-thirds silhouettes, one-third socks, uh, or buy twice as many silhouettes as you have socks. Uh, and that should set you up pretty well for about any scenario. Um, now, the next thing that I want to talk about as we start to wrap this up here is how to submit your questions. Again, this is a, a big Q&A kind of series, and I want to be able to answer all of your questions. And I'm not just talking to brand new guys, but also guys who have been hunting for 20 or 30 years who just want a different take on things. Okay, So uh, you can submit your questions directly to me through my email at forest, F-O-R-R-E-S-T, at diebombindustries.com. 
I'm happy to answer your questions. I'll give you a brief answer there, but then I'll also try to incorporate all these questions in this series, because if you've thought of this question, you're not the first. There's other people out there who are probably wondering the same thing. So thank you for sending in your questions. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, thanks for watching Field Facts with Forrest. One more thing, go ahead, go down below, click that like button. It makes me feel really good. And while you're at it, why don't you go ahead and subscribe because you're not gonna wanna miss out on this fun and informative series.